Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, I'm not really departing from the book of Acts today, but I want to read this passage in 1 Timothy because it relates to the message this morning as well as to our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Now, if you wish to stand, you may do so at this time for the reading of God's Word. The book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Paul is writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy, and he says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Let's bow together as we pray. Thank you for your living word, O Lord. Eternal in nature and all sufficient. Guide us in our time together, we ask. May it all be for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Rather than moving on into Acts 15, I thought we would review some verses we've considered over the last several months, and in doing so, seek to answer a very important question, especially as we once again celebrate our nation's independence. The question is this, and you hear this posed sometimes, don't you? Is it ever biblically legitimate to disobey the government. Now, as we think about that, let's remember that in a number of places where Paul and Barnabas ministered, they would enjoy a favorable response initially. But then the enemies of the gospel would begin reviling them, attacking them. And keep in mind that these enemies were the governing authorities of that day. Yes, they were Jewish religious leaders, but they were the ones who called the shots, at least in that region of the world. Of course, those Jewish leaders were themselves under the domination of the Roman Empire. But whether Jewish or Roman authority, and here's the point that needs to be made, whether Jewish or Roman, Paul and Barnabas would never submit to their commands if it meant disobeying God. So then, how did Paul and Barnabas respond to rejection and opposition from the governing authorities of their day? Well, here are some principles that they followed. First of all, they were not intimidated, but rather emboldened when opposition came. And of course, that's the opposite of what their enemies were after. But Paul and Barnabas were not intimidated. Rather, they were emboldened. In chapter 13, we saw that in the face of great opposition, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, as verse 46 tells us in chapter 13. Also recall, if you will, that in Acts 4, remember this, Peter and John stood before the Jewish council. The Bible says in verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Nevertheless, these religious rulers commanded them, as verse 18 says, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But as you know, Peter and John refused to obey this order. They said to their opponents these words, 
whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Then later in chapter 5, the apostles were arrested and put in prison. However, an angel came during the night and set them free. Don't you love it when angels show up to do what God has sent them to do? So the apostles did what at that point? Did they decide to hold back? No. They started proclaiming the good news of the gospel once again. And once again, they were brought before the Jewish authorities to give an account for their disobedience. In verse 29 of chapter 5, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Peter, interestingly, Peter then launches into a mini-sermon, although it wasn't received well. In fact, verse 33 says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. And we think we have troubles sometimes. (laughs) But Peter, John, Stephen, Paul, Barnabas, and countless others kept right on proclaiming the truth of the gospel and exalting the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the courage of these men, think about this, the courage of these men in continuing to speak the Word of God boldly did not come from their strong personalities or their personal tenacity. No, it came from the Holy Spirit who enabled them to speak as they did. For example, we're told in Acts 4 verse 31 that when the believers gathered to pray, Listen to this. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Hey, those two things go together. Being filled with the Spirit and speaking with boldness the Word of God. So obviously we must disobey the government if it is telling us to go against the clear teaching of God's Word. Paul and Barnabas did. And multitudes down through the centuries, right up to this present day, have done the same. Now, the question might come up, but didn't Paul say in Romans 13 that we are to obey the governing authorities? Yes, indeed he did. In fact, he said, there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Paul goes on to say that a ruler is God's servant for your good. However, when the government demands that we go against the teaching of the Bible, we must not submit to that kind of ungodly directive. We must not compromise the truth in order to appease the governing authorities. For example, think about the German soldiers who participated in genocide back during World War II, and later went on trial for their war crimes in Nuremberg. When the court interrogated them, they all said the same thing. I was only following orders. But the court refused to uphold their excuse and said that the soldiers were actually required to disobey that order rather than commit genocide. And this is in line with the teaching of the Bible, isn't it? We must obey those in authority. Yes, indeed, we must obey them unless they command us to do something God forbids or they forbid us to do something that God commands. Now, there are some people who will say, well, it's all right to practice your faith as long as you don't bring it into the public arena. You must keep it private, keep it personal, keep it to yourself. And we're told that this will ensure that the financial support we give to the church will remain tax deductible. In fact, tax exempt status is sometimes an intimidation that is held over the church and other nonprofit organizations to keep them from being critical of the government. And that is not a good thing. It undermines the First Amendment. Now, I want to say this. I'm glad that the church has tax-exempt status, and I hope that will always be the case. 
But there are things that are far more important in the life of the church. And if it ever gets to the point where the church has to compromise God's word in order to keep its tax exemption, then we should refuse to compromise. I mean, that really should be a no-brainer for every believer. Now, another issue has to do with what is often called the separation of church and state. But we need to understand that this phrase is not found in the United States Constitution, nor in the Declaration of Independence. That idea originated in a private comment by Thomas Jefferson, who meant that no one denomination or religion should be established as the state church. And of course, we would agree with that. And yet, in our day, separation of church and state has come to mean the separation of God from government. In other words, God must be completely removed from secular matters of state. But folks, nothing could be further from the purposes upon which this nation was founded. Now, the church and the state have a very different role. They have different functions, but both have been ordained by God and both are accountable to God. Theologian R.C. Sproul has written, The minute a culture or a government claims independence from God, it becomes godless. It is the responsibility of the church to have a prophetic voice in the culture, to call sin, sin, wherever it emerges in government or anywhere else in the public arena. He is so right, and actually we see that throughout the Bible. The prophets, for example, the prophets along with others spoke to the cultural and political issues of the day. And Jesus did the same, even going into the temple, the place of rulers, and overturning the money changers' tables. So as we see in the book of Acts, the apostles were not intimidated by opposition, but rather emboldened to keep going, to keep preaching, to keep serving, to keep winning others, to keep declaring the glorious good news of the gospel through Jesus Christ alone. Secondly, here's the second principle. Paul and Barnabas did not take rejection personally. They didn't seek to defend their reputations or bemoan their bruised egos. (laughs) No, instead they recognized that the Jews of that day were rejecting God himself by thrusting aside his word, as we see in verse 46 of Acts 13. But Paul and Barnabas knew that when one door closed, God would open another one. They knew that because they saw it happen again and again. And this has been true down through the centuries. It continues to be true right up to this very day. So if the witness you give is rejected, don't ever take that personally. It is Jesus and his gospel that is being rejected. And of course, that saddens us, but it also motivates us to pray for people all the more. Here's a third truth. As we're thinking about the response of Paul and Barnabas to opposition, and that's this, God's word guided them in the midst of rejection and persecution. It was God's word, God's truth that guided them in how they lived their lives and in the message they proclaimed. So when the Jews rejected the gospel, Paul and Barnabas turned to the Gentiles. And in doing so, they were fulfilling the promise of Isaiah 49, 6, where God says, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. You see, Jewish opposition to the message of the gospel actually provided an opportunity for that message to spread among the Gentiles throughout the world. So we must not give up when others reject or criticize us. Like Paul and Barnabas, we must continue to proclaim the truth of the gospel and trust God to open hearts to it and bring people to faith in Christ. Now, this will involve our being diligent students of the Scriptures, right? 
diligent students of the Bible as long as we live. You know, several years ago, one of our church members who is now in heaven called and said he wanted to take me to lunch. And afterwards, he wanted us to go to the Christian bookstore. Well, those are two places I like, restaurants and bookstores. This man wanted me to go with him so I could recommend some study tools for him to use. And it was a delight to do so. I thought, now here's a guy who plans to keep learning and growing in God's Word as long as he lives. And he did. It reminds me of the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy when he asked him to bring the books and above all the parchments as we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul had just made the great statement that is so often quoted. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But even after saying that, he still wanted Timothy to bring him the books. The papyrus scrolls, which probably were Old Testament writings. You see, Paul had no plans, no plans at all to lay aside his studies or writing, even while in prison. He never stopped walking with God. He never stopped growing spiritually through the Word. Charles Spurgeon said this about Paul. He is inspired, and yet he wants books. He has been preaching for at least 30 years, and yet he wants books. He has seen the Lord, and yet he wants books. He had been caught up into the third heaven and had heard things which it was unlawful for a man to utter, yet he wants books. He had written the major part of the New Testament, and yet he wants books. So it was God's Word that guided Paul and Barnabas even in the midst of great rejection and persecution and the more we are guided by the Word, the stronger we will become spiritually. And the more we are able to stand for the right things in a culture that has become so enamored with the wrong things. Evangelist and Bible teacher Vance Havner, one of my favorites, once wrote a book entitled Hearts of Fire. And even though he wrote it many, many years ago, it still speaks so powerfully to our age today. In a chapter called On Being Faithful, Habner wrote, everything is measured by how big and how loud. Everything must be huge, gigantic, colossal, super duper. Even the new drugs are wonder drugs. You take them and wonder what will happen next. <laughs> and then Habner says, in such a time, it is hard to interest people in plain old obedience and faithfulness. And yet, as you well know, that's the key to making a difference in this culture. A culture that has dramatically changed in the last few years. But in the midst of it all, God does not change. And God continues to call His people to plain old obedience and faithfulness. Here's a final truth that encourages all of us as we think about biblical responses to opposition. Here it is. Those early Christians were constantly encouraged by God's promises regarding the future. That is to say, they knew, they knew a day was coming in which God would make all things right. For example, Three times in Psalm 96, a psalm I was studying not too long ago. Three times in that psalm, the psalmist speaks of God coming to judge the earth in the future. Now, when the psalmist speaks of God judging, he's not speaking solely of God condemning. He's speaking of God setting all things right by bringing justice and righteousness to creation. And it is this great promise that leads the psalmist to call all heaven and earth to rejoice. And one day all creation will rejoice and rejoice exceedingly. I mean, just read the last book of the Bible and you'll see that Jesus wins. Righteousness prevails. 
Satan loses. Sorrow and sickness disappear. Death will be no more. A new heaven and a new earth will come down. And God himself will wipe away every tear from every eye. And if that doesn't ring your bell, check your pulse. I mean, really, check your pulse. God is on the throne. He keeps his promises. What he says will happen will happen. He does as he pleases, and he's always pleased with what he does. He's God. He's perfect in all of his ways. Aren't you glad that's the God we know? That's the God we serve. That's the God who has redeemed us from sin and brought us into his family. All praise and glory be to him. Our God reigns, doesn't he? (laughs) Amen. He reigns on high, and he reigns forevermore. Now, we know all too well that things are not right now as they should be in our world. That's right. That is, for, in fact, that's a great understatement I just made. Things are not as they should be in our world. And we also know that God's people are to pursue peace and justice in every way that we can. But folks, the Bible tells us that a day is coming when there will be great rejoicing, for in that day everything will be set right. And we must never lose sight of that fact. No matter how difficult life becomes for us now, never lose sight of the fact that a new day is coming, a new world is coming. Jesus will reign supreme, and all things, and I mean all things, will be set right. Never lose sight of that. C.S. Lewis said it well. I think he said everything well. (laughs) He said, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others to do the same. Oh, there's great comfort and encouragement in pondering the future that God has promised to his children. So in the meantime, in the meantime, we must always remember that God is bigger than our opponents. And he's bigger, he's bigger than our personal setbacks. As Jeremiah 96 verse 10 says, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. That's good to say, isn't it? Say among the nations. Say in your home. Say in your church family. Say in your community, the Lord reigns. All praise be to him. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus on the cross. This is what not only made our forgiveness and salvation possible. It is what has made that new day possible that is coming when sin and sorrow will flee and there will be no more tears. Oh, how grateful we are that through the death of our Lord, we have been saved from your wrath, dear Father, forgiven of our sins, washed from all guilt, freed from the law's condemnation, and declared righteous before the very throne of heaven. Father, how could we ever plumb the depths of such sacrifice on our behalf? Jesus taking our sin upon himself so that we might become the perfect righteousness of God in him. Father, we know that it will take an eternity in heaven just just to discover the glories of this amazing truth. But we rejoice now and we give thanks now for our glorious Redeemer. Help us to exalt him, O Lord, through the observance of the Lord's Supper. And help us to commit our lives afresh to walking with Christ daily in the power of your living word. In the name of our risen, ascended, and reigning Lord Jesus, I pray, amen.